Uh, hi everyone, nice to see you, see you all today. Um, so, just wanted to first present myself. I'm Shazman Manji uh, and my colleague uh, Philippe Polite. Uh, we both work for the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. Uh, and today we wanted to um, present you a little bit about a project on which we've been working on called Open City in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and most especially we want to talk about more how to initiate participatory open data in public policies um, involving local communities in uh, the island of St. Lucia. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so first, uh, Open City is what it is. Uh, it's a methodology that aims to create data for risk management in specific localities. Um, but the specificity of this methodology is really to engage the active participation of local communities and really of open mapping communities as well. Um, so what we want to do is really to generate missing open data for public policies um, and consolidate long-term capacities because uh, the flow of information, the flow of data uh, that comes into a street map um, then can be maintained. Um, so the open city methodology has been implemented so far in um, many countries, so uh, several cities in, uh, in mostly in Africa and in Southeast Asia. And it's only starting now in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. So with this pilot uh, of Open City uh, on which we're working on, it's implemented in five different uh, countries, in St. Lucia, in Jamaica, in Dominica, uh, and then in Latin America for uh, Mexico and Guatemala. So it all ties up together for the humanitarian open street map, map because since 2021, uh, we've been trying to develop new activities in Latin America and in the Caribbean in view of the creation of an open mapping hub in this region. Um, so we kind of want to use the project to outline, to show that we can create collaboration with very long-term potential um, and create this collaboration with open mapping communities in the region um, and to really grow um, that, uh, that collaboration with, uh, with the different partners and especially with uh, the risk prevention mm -hmm. and sustainable development partners in that region. Um, and what we want to be doing is kind of matching the opportunities that we see with the open map mapping communities uh, and the needs of the local governments as well as the local communities. Um, the thing is, uh, in, the, the, in Latin America, uh, there is a lot of um, OSM communities, some are larger and some are smaller, um, but in the Caribbean more especially, uh, the OSM communities are mostly small uh, and in some places non-existent. Uh, so that's where uh, we want to put a lot of the, uh, of the work that we do with uh, with open cities, really fostering those uh, open city, uh, the, those o OSM, uh, OSM communities. So I'm sure you want to hear more about the project. So I'll just give uh, the talk to um, Philippe, uh, who is the project manager for uh, open city in Saint Lucia, Dominica, and Jamaica. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shadman. Um, as mentioned, I'm project manager for the Caribbean section, and that's um, mainly for St. Lucia, Dominica, and Jamaica. But the idea of open cities is really to create it as a model for the rest of the Caribbean. Um, St. Lucia is the first one starting off, and um, we're presenting St. Lucia uh, mainly because it's, it's a really a, a good average of what is represented in the Caribbean. Um, just out of simplicity, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Caribbean. I am a native of St. Lucia. Um, but you can see St. Lucia is very small, probably smaller than Pima County where we are here. Um, the population is only about 180 plus thousand uh, people, um, 240 square miles. And um, just generally, I guess it's about 14 degrees north, so that's in the tropics. Uh, we refer to it as the Eastern Caribbean, which is that smaller chain of islands on the, on the outer edge. And um, just history-wise, uh, we speak English with a French influence, and we just got independence in, in uh, 1979. And um, 
essentially, it's it's a good balance between some of the other Caribbean islands. Barbados, which you might be heard of, St. Lucia is a little bit bigger than Barbados, but smaller than Jamaica. And our population is kind of like mid-range. So in this sense, it's a, a good idea of um, using it as like a, a pilot and template here. Now for the nastiest stuff. Um, the islands really are, a colleague of mine likes to call it um, like a bowling alley for hurricanes. Um, I'm sure if you're familiar with Florida again, the hurricanes, it normally actually sweeps through that chain of islands and then sweeps up. Um, so it really is like a nail-biting um, time when hurricanes come through and it's like, which island is it going to hit? Um, most recently, St. Lucia had a Hurricane Tomas in 2010. And this picture here on the side is a scour from a landslide that occurred during that um, a hurricane. It uh, was more of a rain event and um, there was a house on there and when the hill went with it, uh, I don't think they ever found the housing. Um, but uh, we've had numerous uh, events. A Christmas trough was just a low level trough and it was just an event that just dumped uh, rain on St. Lucia on Christmas Eve for two days straight. It was not expected and um, caused a lot of uh, infrastructure damage. But not only that, we're sitting right on the edge of the Caribbean plates. Most of these islands actually have volcanoes on them. St. Lucia has a driving volcano, it has a collapsed crater, you can actually drive right through it. Um, but needless to say, we have earthquakes, tremors all the time. And um, of course, because of the terrain, as you can see, the landslides are very prevalent and uh, flooding in the low-lying areas. But uh, our approach with this is uh, two prong. We look at natural disasters as well as vulnerable communities, persons living in vulnerable areas, persons who are, are more susceptible to um, losing their livelihoods, losing their lives when something happens. Um, two of the uh, main areas are like congestion, people living just very, very close to each other. Um, as you can see in the middle picture, if a fire starts right there, it's going to be uh, very, very challenging for emergency personnel to, to deal with. Um, and just general uh, health concerns of persons living very tightly together. Sometimes you don't know which structures are which. Um, uh, one anecdote is that um, there's an area in St. Lucia that we're actually going to do some mapping on. It is built around, we're going to call it a graveyard, because they moved most of the uh, important parts and shifted it off site um, to another cemetery. And the tombstones are still remaining and people are living around these tombstones. If you're familiar with mapping and you look at an aerial image, sometimes you may not be able to tell if it's a house or a tombstone or a dog house. And some of these areas are outside kitchens still, outside bathrooms. So having some of our mapping done with local knowledge, local insight, they'll be able to tell where some of these areas are and what can be done about them. Because some of the general mapping just doesn't really capture it from a, a global perspective. Um, and then there was a lot of unplanned development, um, unsafe structures, some houses are flat, some are on stilts, when flooding happens, what happens with them, uh, gutters and gullies passing around, a uh, lot of uh, uncharted footpaths, how do emergency personnel get to them, it's uh, just a lot of challenges and one of our focuses is in congested areas for these vulnerable communities. So the approach is really to get into some of the stakeholders and see how we can manage and create this culture and awareness for open mapping in the region. Um, when we say stakeholders, generally we think of probably data users and data providers. Uh, for this presentation, I, I like to look at it more as um, data authorities and data prodigies in the sense that sometimes the data authorities don't necessarily have all the data. They have authority on the data, but they don't collect the data. Um, we had some aerial images collected last in 2007, and they're only now updating them. That's way over 10 years. Um, there's drone technology now. There's, there's reasons why this stuff should be more updated. Um, so examples of the National Emergency Management Corporation, um, the Statistics Office, these agencies are really just uh, having the data, but they don't really 
get the currency. The data prodigies are the ones going to be the, the youth committees, the Red Cross, the community leaders. So the idea is to really incorporate them, get them to do the open mapping, and then cycle that information on there. So then when the data authorities, which we're going to sensitize, start using this information, they're going to make it um, more robust, and then it's going to cycle back to the data prodigies, and then create this new effect of um, how we use data, um, and more the acceptance of the data. Um, we're focusing on just two main areas, uh, the needs of the emergency management agency and the statistics agency. The emergency management agency has a mandate for doing the life cycle of disaster management, which is um, collecting data anywhere from um, mitigation to recovery. Um, and then they have a, a relationship already with the youth committee, with the Red Cross, so the synergy is met there, so it's kind of ties in already. The Central Statistics Authority, they have to do Census 2020. Census 2020 hasn't happened yet since COVID um, struck. So we're actually using that, that buffer time to give them more information, let their um, statisticians go out and collect data more efficiently so they can get all of this data needed. Um, so generally we have three problems that we're going to focus on. Um, basically adding the um, priority areas to the open street map. We're going to create sustainable communities, and this is actually the main pillar, creating communities that are a culture of community of mapping and growing this. So even beyond the life cycle of the project, more people are getting into it. As you said, the OSM community is very low in the Caribbean, so the idea is to do that, and lastly, do training. Train the trainers, get people to be involved. When the project goes on, people are still have the knowledge base um, down part. Um, the local implementing team, uh, which is for St. Lucia, has already started. And um, they've done uh, stakeholder engagement, done several meetings with uh, various agencies, both at local and district level. Um, and right now they're at a stage of getting MOUs to really solidify what's been going on with uh, the project. Public awareness, where they're doing um, an official launch, they have a Facebook page, and then after that we're going to do a YouTube channel, um, state of the map presentation, Check mark. And um, there's also a mapathon that's going to be happening uh, later with uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Johnson, who's um, here. And then uh, more training. We had one training session, it went very well. With the short, um, with the short session, uh, we already had a, a small group in two hours to about 3,000 edits, and these were newbies. So um, the next activity is to keep these uh, sessions going. We could have a total of six sessions. And um, the next two sessions are already uh, booked up because uh, we got a, a good response on that first um, session. So I added these pictures to make it not seem like St. Lucia and the Caribbean is all gloom. I'm sure you all do that. Um, but uh, hope you got a little bit more insight and welcome any of your questions.